wo Zui ho feiern, tan wo Shu Zui bangte. Wo Shu Zui bangte. Ah, schöne Nisha, Chi wo Zai Wuhan feiert, wo Ai Chuko. We'll continue in English, so you follow me. So um, we're here to talk about innovation and this wonderful book that the CPA uh, translates into uh, Chinese. You've done this for the last uh, six years, and uh, and it's uh, it's been done since 2010. Uh, it's been a book where we collect uh, the best innovations uh, around the world. We do it on behalf of FIP. And we indeed present to you every year uh, the best, best, best practice from all over the world. Uh, I believe if you came here, you have a copy of this. We have copies of the English edition as well at a special price. Uh, but uh, if you cannot get a hold of the book, do let me know and we'll make sure we get you one. Yes. So it's about the best practice, best successful case studies of what's been done out there. Uh, based on three criteria, which you've heard before, an increase in reach, revenue, or relevance. And uh, it's 12 months of consultancy, 12 months of work. Uh, and indeed, uh, we can safely say that you know your company, but we do know uh, the industry. And we try with this book and with our consultancy work to disrupt uh, disruption and to indeed puncture the hype. There's a lot of hype out there, there's a lot of things being sold to you, and it is important to have your head straight and clear criteria every year as to what you should put your money into, because there's a lot of distractions and a lot of things that perhaps you could save time and money by looking at best practice out there. We try to organize chaos, we do this with a lot of clients globally, these are some of our clients, and we help companies to make this transition to digital in a way that is monetized from day one. And this is the first thing I want to talk to you about, uh, monetization. Um, second, I'll talk about digital narratives, I'll talk about distributed content, uh, about media tech, a little bit about print innovation just to conclude. And a little bit of offbeat in the book, uh, I don't have time to go through it today, uh, but the focus is going to be pretty much on monetization. I want to talk about 11, 11 business models. You thought you just had one to pursue. And it was quite simple, that was the past. We made money from selling subscriptions, uh, creating an audience, and of course selling advertising uh, against uh, those uh, readers and connecting them with advertisers. And that was our job, advertising revenue and reader subscription revenue. But there are 11 business models to go through today which I think is very interesting because it opens your mind to so many other possibilities that you didn't think of. Uh, in our advice, you need to have at least three of these 11 business models up and running. And one of them is absolutely essential that you get it started, if it's not started already, and you really very much focus on that. And as you do this business modeling exploration, uh, this is perhaps a matrix for you to understand how you go about it, this is with our client of ours, and it shows you uh, the, the, the matrix of product and content to pursue. Uh, some things are obviously more difficult, more expensive to implement, but you have a higher return on investment. Uh, the easier ones have a lesser uh, return on investment. You really, this is a, obviously the product of a client, uh, but you should, really should have a mix of lower right quadrant with upper left quadrant for you to get started with this, at least three out of the 11 business models. So, first of all, uh, these business models are B2C players. The paid content publisher, we all have heard about it at this conference, how important it is to return to a model where indeed digital news subscriptions uh, become, become a steady source of income. And we see it all over the world, uh, with the Washington Post, of course, the New York Times, uh, magazines globally, uh, but you need scale to get there, and you need to be customer-centric and, of course, uh, a distinctive voice. Uh, a lot of people are asking what I should be uh, using as a method to charge for the content, as opposed to asking the question, do I have any, any content worth charging for? Second, the publisher as a club. This is very interesting, and a lot of us have lost sight of the benefits of this, uh, and we bring you some best practice out there 
Uh, the Guardian is an interesting club concept. Uh, and we also have uh, La Nación. La Nación we perhaps have identified as the best club uh, in the world. It's been running for a long, long time and it creates tremendous benefits, tremendous loyalties and a lot of discounts. And you do belong to La Nación Club and buying a subscription, being part of the brand is much more than just getting a newspaper or getting an app uh, that you have access to for news. It's really a whole experience. So if you want to look at how to do a very consumer-driven club, uh, La Nación is a good example. CTAM in the UK is also transforming its model to a little bit of a similar model to uh, a lifestyle brand that very much becomes a club concept. You get discounts for experiences in the City of London. They have agreements with retailers with a barter deal. So you can show your City AM card and you get a discount at restaurants uh, for services, etc. So it's just started, but we, we like the model. What we've seen is quite heartening for someone that was essentially a free uh, a newspaper in the morning uh, for the City of London. The publisher is a retailer. Uh, we have some interesting examples. Of course, we all have heard of uh, net a -Portet and how they transformed into uh, a magazine as its flagship to indeed sell content through its website. But we see the weekend of uh, offer of the Financial Times, how to spend it. They very much turn this into a publisher as a retailer. They do this through this sub-brand called Eclectables and is a similar model to that of the New York Times. You get a percentage for the recommendations and the actual uh, uh, purchases that are done by clicking on the website. And magazines are really better than news brands. So it's much easier for you to make this transformation to retail. Uh, you really, the, the danger of losing uh, the trust of the, of the credibility is much lesser than that of news brands. Uh, you heard of the case of Dennis and buy a car. A phenomenal example where they're more than double their revenues as a result of this venture of becoming a retailer. Um, the strategies of uh, New York Magazine is also doing very well with this same concept and its editor recommendations. They've been doing them for decades, now they're turning it into a profit center. And uh, with affiliate links, they get a really interesting new income of, uh, of, of readers clicking through and buying. So it's e commerce, but very much anchored on content. But we also see that retailers are also uh, better at becoming publishers, of course, Amazon buying the Washington Post. Uh, it is no accident that this has now happened in three global markets that retailers are buying into uh, news brands or magazine brands. The publisher is an event organizer. What can I say about this? You know all about it. Uh, but we already see clients that have 40% of the revenue coming from events. Uh, you have to sustain it. Uh, the profit, uh, the, the margins, the profit margins are very, very small. They're not huge things, but they help you to build a lot of the other uh, business propositions. So, if you want to go into the club business, this is a good one to have. If you want to go into the retail business, this is a good one to have as well, up and running. Yes. And also, not just doing events, but doing a whole week or festivals. I think this is a, a new trend uh, where you sustain something over a weekend or more than two or three days. Uh, content is just part of the experience but throughout the week in two or three days you can have uh, a, a long-lasting event rather than an afternoon. So weekends we see for consumer magazines it, it's a big space. They're moving into weekend events that really begin on a Friday and last until Sunday, so three-day weekend propositions. Uh, Grazia is doing very well with this one. Uh, interesting profit margins for them. The publisher is a philanthropist. Uh, many of you, of course, here are associated with universities and so on. There is a case to be made. We've seen Mother Jones, we've seen other people. Uh, it's in, you'll be surprised what revenue you can get if you indeed make the case to your readers that you're an institution worth preserving and worth uh, promoting. And we're seeing that, that it can be an interesting source of revenue and you can reach out to foundations, you can reach out to governments if you can make an efficient case that indeed you are an institution. Let's talk about business to business play as part of these business models. Uh, number six business model is the publishers and agency. Uh, we've highlighted three very interesting examples, 23 stories by Condé Nast, 
at CNBC Catalyst. This is you turning your creative team and all your resources into a 360 agency, uh, but very much focused on doing all the marketing for the client as opposed to uh, just being an agency where you place the content at the end of it. And uh, of course, for native, which is how this is expressed mostly, it's really about the margins and the revenue. Uh, so by becoming an agency, you can indeed get as much, as much margin out of it as possible. So without a doubt, you must contemplate launching your own agency to capitalize on this. Uh, the publisher is an advertiser. Uh, this is where you actually create the content. We've highlighted the series by The Atlantic um, and they're doing a fantastic uh, tie-up with IBM and they're doing the entire content so they charge for three things uh, content creation, uh, content placement and of course the uh, content uh, distribution as well in other media. So a licensing business as well of this wonderful content that you can create so uh, the publisher as the advertiser, the creative agency creating the content uh, and having a team that only journalistically uh, or in a publishing environment can create this kind of wonderful interactive multimedia digital content. The publisher is a data broker. Now this is very, very interesting and I think uh, here for China it has tremendous, tremendous potential. So um, this is you know, if you look at marketing, marketing teams really, they need to demonstrate the effectiveness of their spend. And it is us, publishers, who have the ability to demonstrate the effectiveness of that marketing spend. And if you really, really look at the success of Facebook and the other players, it is because of this, because they produced this. And the whole scandal with Cambridge Analytica was because of the realisation of how good they were at micro-tagging and micro-targeting. Uh, and of course it created a huge scandal for Facebook, but it demonstrated the power of data brokering. And uh, we have a wonderful example, and I encourage you to look at this. This has been named uh, by Fast Company as one of the world's most innovative companies at the moment in digital. Uh, this is a beautiful destination. It started accidentally as an Instagram feed. And then they developed the skills to tell you exactly which photographs work the best, how are they, how they should be edited, who should be in the photographs, uh, and all this based on an algorithm. It's not a creative team looking at it. They test out photographs, they send them out randomly, and based on the data they get back, they're able to create these wonderful, wonderful feeds. And uh, beautiful organizations, it, it really is it's filtering the crops, the settings, which ones perform the best. And now they've turning, they've turned this, you could call it a media business, into a full-on branded agency. So they're doing these incredible campaigns for um, a number of destinations. They've done it for I Love New York, they've done it for Incredible India, and so on. And they're advising airlines, hotel chains as well to do this. So it's turning the data, developing through AI an algorithm as to what works. Um, obviously, initially there's some creative input from a creative director, but most of it is data program. The publisher is a brand licensor. Uh, we've heard how important this is uh, for you to get additional revenue from a reader revenue. Of course, Disney, the best one at doing this, but National Geographic also uh, doing white label uh, cruise ships with their name. And we've seen this with GQ. This is uh, GQ uh, swimming trunks. Um, we've seen it with Glamour. This is a Glamour on fashion line, Glamour magazine. And we've seen it with Men's Health with uh, these uh, products, uh, beef jerky, and uh, a very interesting revenue as a result of you creating the content and you licensing uh, the brand name to a reliable um, a retailer of beef jerky. And of course, other cases as well with Monopoly. The publisher is an IT provider. We've had uh, three clients in the last five years who are making a lot of money out of this. One of them in South Africa, another one in India. They took a bunch of people, put them in a garage, and they created their own CMS system, their own technology, their own CRM system, one of them, and now they're selling them on um, to, with tremendous, tremendous margins. So a lot of you have incredible in-house expertise from developers. We highlight three cases, uh, 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 Techniques Ukblad in uh, Norway, 
We've got also Pudge, and we've got uh, Washington Post. And if you look at Amazon, this is an interesting graphic. If you look at Amazon, without its technology business, it would not be making money. So really, it's web services. It's licensing of its software is what makes it money throughout. The publisher is an investor. And of course, this is uh, you creating an environment within your editorial department or your operation where you indeed invite startups to be part of your setup. And this is what you can offer them. Uh, you know, lean product service and UX design specialists, of course, access to research, product testing, uh, an audience for you to also test that product directly down to. So don't be afraid of going into the startup business and attracting people trying different setups uh, locally. It can really, really work. So here are 11 business models. Pay content, the publisher's a club, as a retailer, as an events organizer, as a philanthropist, agency, advertiser, data broker, brand, license, brand licensor, an IT provider, or an investor. We believe you must have at least three of these going. Without three, your business risks being either too vulnerable or too dependent on one of them. And of all these 11, and certainly out of those three, you must, must focus on reader revenue. You must migrate from ad revenue to reader revenue. This is the original sin of publishing. We need to address it. That free today will pay off tomorrow is not going to happen. We need to get redemption from this sin. We need to get it behind us. We need to cleanse ourselves from it. And uh, if in 2018 you're not charging for your content, you really should get out of publishing. Um, there are many other things you must do, but you must begin to charge for some content. You must rebalance the business. Uh, you really have to ask for data or for dollars. And sometimes the data, that registration can be worth more than the dollars that you may be asking for immediately. So data or dollars, this is a way you're asking for people to transact with you. Um, now, if you don't do this, really it is game over. And of course, there are different saturation points. If you're a small market, you will not be able to rebalance your business entirely from reader revenue. But uh, you must start, and it's a healthy way for you to pursue this. So you must have either a data wall or a pay wall. Those two things are essential. Because digital advertising on its own will never ever pay the bills. We know this and yet many of us are still doing volume plays. We're trying to create huge communities and expecting the advertising and digital to pay for that. It will not happen. It will not pay your editorial costs. We know how this movie ends. We've seen the end of the book. We've read the epilogue. So it will never pay the bills. And you know why? Uh, and not having it is like being a one-legged stool not having read of revenue going, that piston of the engine up and running, yes. We know why. Facebook and the Google duopoly, uh, at least in the West, of course, in your case, uh, you've got other dominant digital players, Weibo, Alibaba, and others, yes. I won't go into too much detail about this. But free, free is very expensive. So, and if something is cheap, something, someone and some organization inevitably pays, pays that price, you know. So you really should look at digital as that everything that generates value should generate revenue. So it's not about closing, you know, there's a wonderful Chinese proverb, you cannot close a door that has been open uh, for too long. So it's been 20 years, the door has been open. So it's not about turning everything into something you charge for. It's about finding where there is value and charging for it. And GQ and other people have been saying this globally. This is the main conversation at the moment everybody exploring how to do it. Um, so how do you migrate from ad revenue to reader revenue? This is a traditional funnel, and if you look closely, you can see the data wall up above and the pay wall below. These are some of the sample products you would use to get them. And, um, and this is a, a conversion funnel to see how, it, uh, this is a specific line, how it turned 20 million unique visitors into uh, a very interesting percentage of subscribers, 5% to be specific, uh, in a period of two years. Equalis is doing it well, and, um, and, and of course, another interesting example here is um, New, Yorker magazine, New Yorker magazine. This was very much uh, 
a publication that depended on its print proposition. Uh, it has completely turned into a reader revenue model and now its digital readers exceed the print readers. They now contribute 65% of the revenue, that's the combined print and digital, but they believe they can double this by 2023. And this was, for them, digitally, something they did not contemplate not long ago, and now they're well into it. Uh, circulation has risen 12.3% last year to 1.2 million. Uh, in the city of New York, a very tribal magazine, and it's working quite well. An objective to have reader revenue should be 40% 40, 40 of your digital revenue model. When we model this, this is the end game. This is the destination where you want to get to. Uh, it may take you five years, it may take you seven years, but this is a good uh, rule of thumb to have as you begin this journey of reader revenue. Then you talk about digital revenues, a uh, 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 narratives a little bit about robot stories. Uh, you may not know about this, but this is now catching on quite quickly with artificial intelligence. In the book we talk about Heliograph, fascinating case from the Washington Post, uh, where they've indeed uh, robot uh, written stories. They did it for the Olympics. They had 350 reports being done. They've done it with election reports. They've done it with local school uh, uh, local school sports results, etc. And this is essentially automating a lot of things that you pay journalists to do, corporate reports, uh, announcements, and so on. So they're fascinating, and the software is not that complicated to implement, and indeed it can produce phenomenally accurate content. They're 100% accurate if indeed the source of the information is accurate. Of course, they can be produced at all time in all languages, and, uh, and you're halfway to chatbots and automated video, we'll talk about this in a moment. And the running costs are very, very small compared to the human costs. And the important thing is that it frees the human journalists to do proper journalism. I'm not going to spend too much time on distributed content, but just so you know, uh, the dynamics here are similar to the dynamics in the West. Uh, the, the message to, 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 to share with you in terms of best practice is that publishers have realized that really there is no end game, there really is no upside to distributing your content in these big, big social media platforms. They promised a wonderful uh, rainbow in the horizon uh, and uh, indeed uh, the returns have been very, very uh, disheartening. And what's even more complicated in the West at least is that now we're losing money in those platforms and we're also losing trust because of the problems that exist with fake news. So, um, everybody's ending their addiction to Facebook and trying to get off it. And uh, because it's not just terrible for business, but terrible for the soul, as uh, we have uh, an editor tell us of the New Republic. Yes. But you need to stop playing defense, which has been the dynamic for so long. And you really need to move into a different dynamic. So, really, you have to get people to come to you through these platforms by only serving appetizers. So we've seen two clients and they're just serving two bullet points, in some cases one paragraph of big stories, and you do not lose traction, no traction at all, and people are still coming to you directly. So that's a way to turn the whole uh, distribution uh, quandary on its head. An exception in the West is Instagram. Instagram we encourage you to go into, especially for magazines, consumer magazines. It's phenomenal, it has tremendous engagement. These are some of the figures, and uh, much higher than Pinterest, much higher than Snapchat. And uh, people, for some reason, have this wonderful affinity with Instagram. They love it, and uh, they uh, find it uh, uh, mind-relaxing as well, which is a wonderful place for consumer magazines to be a place to disconnect. Let me conclude with MediaTek, because uh, MediaTek is, is, is perhaps where this puncturing of hype and innovation gets confused. We all think that innovation is embracing new technologies all the time. And, uh, and, and perhaps let's talk about what we haven't seen in 2017, which from our point of view is definitive proof that indeed virtual reality is not something for you to spend money on. It's not working. Yeah, it has no traction. 
I don't know how many of you on a regular basis stick one of these things in your head and look at content. I don't know. I haven't met anybody who does this regularly other than kids playing video games and indeed expos like this one where they're trying to sell you the software and so on, uh, which is wonderful if you want to experiment with it. I'm nothing against it. But it's not, not catching on. It has no traction. And yet this was promised as a holy grail, as a great future of publishing. Uh, get out of this. No money in making this. Augmented reality is fascinating. And that really has a lot of interesting potential. So that's something for you to look into, but not virtual reality. But what did we see in MediaTek this year? Um, chatbots. Chatbots are great. And they're really, really having a tremendous uh, uh, uptake. 47% uh, of consumers would buy an item from a chatbot or would happily have a conversation with a chatbot. 59% uh, of millennials, 60% of Gen Xs, they have used a chatbot. Uh, the average adult will perhaps have more conversation with the chatbot than with his or, or, or his, his, her spouse. And this one is very interesting, visual search. This has wonderful potential for magazine content creators. We love this. This is basically through augmented reality and uh, in the new um, um, iPhone uh, 10, you can actually see this in practice. You point at an object and it tells you immediately all the information about it. Visual search is huge, huge to come. Uh, Google is secretly buying all the kids out there working on this code and uh, paying very, very interesting amounts of money, all an NDA. They will not share it with you, but uh, it's fantastic. You walk around, you point at something and you have all the information. So visual search, like text search, is the new frontier, the great innovation for you to be part of. Print innovation is very, very important that you do not lose sight of the need to improve and invest in print innovation. So this year we talk about new print, and new print really means a premium experience. Um, smaller runs, perhaps distribution runs, uh, but really very much premium paying audiences for this. And this is counterintuitive. In an age of, le of, 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 of less print, of everything digital, if you go more print, if you go bigger print, a pricey print, it works. So we're seeing supersized magazines coming out. We're seeing high frequency changing, but a much higher pricing point for those products. So we're seeing also screen fatigue, people exhausted of looking at the screens all week long and they really, really look forward to seeing uh, a magazine in print, in, on paper, at the end of the day. So it's very much a lean back experience. And an interesting concept we're seeing is reverse publishing. Uh, interesting innovation in the sense that uh, now the model of how to do this is quite clever and quite easy to emulate. So reverse publishing, you try something out on digital and you create a threshold and you have to know where that threshold is and once you know that you have an audience for that, you create a print product out of it. So this is uh, Mondadori with this uh, uh, Diallo Saferano who is a, a foodie and this is their food blog. This is a blog that now is turned into a book uh, and a book of recipes and also a magazine of recipes and uh, indeed uh, being sold uh, in advance to a lot of the lovers of the blog, they want to get the printed copy. Uh, Reader's Digest is also doing it with his health tips, uh, turning those into books. And also, looking at the junior market, we're seeing globally parents who are nostalgic about print wanting their kids to read things in print. So, you, this is like Pixar, you market to the parents to get to the kids. So, this is being marketed to parents and is done extremely well in the UK where parents who miss their kids reading a physical product push this on them and the kids like it. This is the weak genius, it's pre-teens and uh, the ritual there between father and son or mother and daughter and so on. It's quite easy to have this print proposition. Some other print innovations for you to look at in the book, etc. So, let me conclude by saying that the single most important innovation, really what this book is about this year, uh, and really is our key message to you, is how you should migrate from read re from ad revenue and from a business model of volume to a business model of value and beginning to charge for reader revenue. 
Um, it's time to find redemption. This has been a huge mistake the publishing did with the digital age, and it needs to be redressed. And everybody is at it, and we're being helped by Netflix. We're being helped by also the music providers um, because they are indeed creating a habit of a younger generation, the millennials, the Generation Xs. They all have Spotify. They all have Netflix. They're all used to paying. But they are now much more willing to pay for content than they were in the past. We have to go beyond just uh, the digital promises. There is no digital salvation. There are no digital miracles uh, unless you invest in content, content that is worth paying for, really there is no future. And it's only, only journalism that will save journalism. It's not technology, it's not new business models, it's not some miracle that is going to come, it's journalism. And journalism doesn't have to be just political journalism. Fashion journalism is good journalism. Storytelling is good uh, journalism when it comes to writing about cars, fishing, hunting, um, industry issues, academic issues. It's still journalism, it's still storytelling. So it's only this, if you can go back to the basics, you'll be able to rebuild your business. So you must innovate or you will die. And as I like to say these days, you have to change or die by charging or dying. Change or die, charge or die. Thank you very much. Shishi.